Um, this is, however, um, one of the main things that I've been working on. It was the focus of my PhD in tropical Australia and in other parts of the world. And But much of the last 20 years or so, I've been involved off and on with this project in the Amazon on forest fragmentation. And some of you may be familiar with it, some of you may won't. I'm not going to assume that you, anybody is. So I'll tell you a little bit about a story, what is, which is now a 35-year uh, project to try to ask what happens when you take the world's greatest and largest rainforest, which contains around 60% of all the world's surviving tropical forest, and what happens when you chop that up into pieces? What happens when you fragment it? And as of course we all know, fragmentation of habitats is one of the biggest things that's happening just about everywhere in the world. Everywhere you look around you, what you see are little fragments, little patches of forest surrounded by some kind of uh, landscape. It may be mo somewhat modified, it may be forestry lands, it may be very hostile, uh, urbanization or a whole variety of different things that affect nature. And as Gretchen well knows from her very long-term studies in Costa Rica with her and her very dynamic group there and other places, um, fragmentation can cause a lot of different changes in, an in the environment. If you've picked up a newspaper, if you watch TV, you've probably one time or another heard things about the Amazon, what's happening in the Amazon. Um, lots of things are going on there. Um, there's very large-scale cattle ranching, vast areas of cattle ranch, oftentimes owned by very wealthy landowners. Some of these landowners have huge areas, hundred thousands of hectares of land, and some of them are clearing several thousand hectares per year on their individual properties. Um, there's large-scale soy ranching, industrial soy ranching, and this is about a ten billion dollar a year export industry now in the Amazon. Um, there's a lot of logging activity, there's uh, small-scale farming, slash and burn farming happening in many places. There's a whole variety of different kinds of land uses that are changing the Amazon forest. One of the most important changes that have been happening in the last 10 years or so have been an avalanche, a tsunami of new roads and highways that are crisscrossing the Amazon, that are penetrating into the heart of the Amazon. Uh, I've been carping for years about roads and a lot of our work has been focusing on the Amazon. We recently had a paper in Nature sort of looking at this on a more global scale, but the road expansion, what we're seeing right now, you know, in the next, um, uh, in, by the year 2050, it's expected that we're going to have about another 25 million kilometers of new roads on the Earth which is more than enough to go around the earth 600 times. And 90% of those roads are gonna be in developing countries like Brazil, like Malaysia, like Indonesia, like uh, the Congo Basin, places that sustain many of the most biologically important and environmentally important ecosystems on the planet. So this is a huge issue and it's a huge issue in the Amazon. Uh, one of the papers that we published some years ago was to ask Brazil at that time came out with a new scheme to put about $40 billion, U.S. dollars, of new infrastructure, including highways, roads, hydroelectric dams, power lines, and gas lines, into the Amazon, sort of, again, crisscrossing across the, the Amazon basin. And our, our question was, well, if all these projects happen, and if deforestation and forest degradation occur near these roads, as has happened in the past, what would the Amazon look like in the future? And so we came up with a couple of different spatial models, a couple of scenarios. This is our optimistic scenario, and this was our non-optimistic scenario. And I think these kind of shocked a lot of people. We ended up sort of appearing in newspapers all over the world. Um, and it shocked a lot of people because what people were starting to realize is that as a consequence of this tsunami of new projects, it's not just that there's going to be more forest loss, but it was increasingly looking like this, you know, the world's last great rainforest was going to get chopped up into pieces. And we know that those pieces, those fragments of forest are much more vulnerable to things like predatory logging and wildfires and other kinds of environmental changes. So there's a lot of concern, not just a lot of forest loss, not just a lot of forest degradation, but a, large, a, really, a lot of really large scale fragmentation of the forest. And then when we start zooming in at finer scales, not just at this scale of this vast area, which is the size of Western Europe, um, we start looking at smaller landscape scales. We also see a lot of fragmentation in many human dominated lands. Here's just a couple of examples here. This is a cattle ranching landscape and these areas in here are mostly cattle ranching and the dark areas are forest. This is a forest colonization landscape where you get the so-called fishbone pattern of deforestation here. But you can see just looking at those, what you tend to get is a lot of fragments that tend to be quite irregularly shaped and also you tend to get a lot of small fragments. This is a 
breakdown for these two landscapes here of the size distributions of the fragments. And you can see here less than one hectare, one to 10 hectares, 10 to 100, et cetera, going on up. What you see is that at least numerically, these landscapes are dominated by small fragments, less than 100 hectares in area. So the reality is in a lot of the human dominated lands in the Amazon, what we are ending up with is a lot of small, oftentimes irregularly shaped habitat fragments. And so a really important question is, well, what's the biological fate? What's the fate of biodiversity in these small, irregular, shredded lands that are increasingly dominating a lot of the landscapes in the Amazon? And it was really this question that underlaid um, a major project that got started in 1979, long before I was involved in this, by a guy named Tom Lovejoy, if you know much about biodiversity and uh, work he's very well known. But this project has been run for a long time now, now 35 years. It's operated cooperatively by the Smithsonian Institution, the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. This is actually where I spent most of my career. Uh, and the IMPA, which is Brazil's National Institute for Amazonian Research. Um, so the big advantage, if you study habitat fragmentation, the big advantage of this study is a team, a large team of people went out and before this landscape was fragmented, there was a big government plan to, to clear a lot of this area to see whether or not large-scale cattle ranching would be a viable way to exploit the forest and exploit the land in this region. And so Tom Lovejoy's inspiration was to say, well, look, since we know they're going to clear the forest, let's go out and study these areas and tell the ranchers where they should clear and where they shouldn't clear so they can create these fragments for us. Um, but they went in and they sampled a whole bunch of things. They looked at trees, birds, amphibians, a lot of different invertebrate groups, small mammals, primates, all kinds of things. They studied very intensively. So the fantastic advantage is we know what was there before these, this landscape was fragmented. And today what we have is a series of cattle ranches, three main cattle ranches that are ranging between three and 5,000 hectares in area, and then a series of 11 forest fragments ranging from one to 100 hectares in area, and then another series of intact sites or control sites in intact forest here. And these have all been monitored, again, for the last 35 years at varying levels and varying degrees, and it's not perfect, but, but all, all in all, it's, it's, it's a pretty, pretty decent experiment. So it is an experiment, okay? This isn't like a typical landscape that you'd probably find in other parts of Brazil, or if you go to Congo Basin, or you go to Southeast Asia, where you wouldn't just see fragmentation, you'd probably also see hunting, logging going on, fires, all kinds of things. Those kinds of things have been controlled there, so that's, that's important. We're looking just at fragmentation, and, they're fa and in fact, even to keep the cattle out, the, the fragments themselves have actually been fenced. So, so it's a pretty controlled experiment. Um, I recently just gave this talk, I went back to the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama, and I gave this talk, and it turns out that there's been a big cut in the budget for our, this project. And the Smithsonian has been one of a number of places that have been funding it, but there's been a core of funding, and they've cut that by 75%, and I've been pleading with them. And for their, many years while I was there, I was always fighting for keeping the budgets maintained for this project. But there's just a few milestones here, and I, this is a new slide, but I put it in there. I'll go ahead and mention it here, but that project has produced you know, almost 650 uh, publications, 17 papers in science and nature, 180 student theses. Most of these are Brazilian students or students from other Latin American countries. Um, over 700 grad students and professionals have been trained in courses, more than 1,000 interns. Again, mostly these are Brazilian or other Latin American students, and many of these students, in fact, have gone on to really have successful careers. Some of the real leaders in Amazon conservation now were actually trained in this project originally. But now the project has been severely downsized. It's just got 25% of its f former staffing. So it's just scraping along, barely able to keep surviving, which is a, seems to me a great tragedy given the fact that there's been such an investment in work there. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the work that's been done, particularly focusing on this stuff uh, that I've been, been uh, helping to lead. Um, so, what I've been uh, uh, responsible for coordinating is a large network of permanent plots across this landscape, forest dynamics plots, and 69 one hectare plots in total, uh, 39 in the fragments, 30 in intact forest, studying a little over 60,000 trees there uh, altogether. Uh, these are sort of standard forest dynamics plots that people use. Uh, about every five years you go back in and you count all the trees that have died and you measure all the trees and see how much bigger they've gotten. You look at any trees that have been damaged, that type of thing. So it's a standard so-called forest dynamics plot. 
We're also studying about 35,000. Oh, and all these trees, by the way, are greater than 10 centimeters diameter at breast height. That's what that means, DBH, which is about this high here, about 1.3 meters. And greater than 10 centimeters means they're bigger than that. So in a rainforest, a tree that big around probably is at least 20 meters tall. So these are, tend to be quite tall trees. Um, we're also studying 35,000 smaller trees between one centimeter on up to about almost 10 centimeters. And then a whole bunch of lianas or woody vines, all greater than 10 centimeters, or two centimeters, excuse me. So, and woody vines, as we'll see, are play into this story here. So this has been this, this large network of plots. And now one thing to emphasize is that the tree diversity here really is remarkably high. In fact, it's just about the biologically richest real estate on the planet Earth. The central Amazon, the western Amazon, and northern Borneo are where we have the highest diversities of trees on the planet that we know about so far. So just to give you an example here, this is the number of tree species that we get on average in a hectare. These are all trees greater than 10 centimeters in diameter. Here's Barro Colorado Island in Panama. Here's La Selva in Costa Rica. These are two of the most famous New World uh, tropical research sites. Here's our site in the central Amazon, okay? So this is either good or bad news, depending on your sort of philosophy about doing science. I mean, it's good news in that, yes, it's this amazingly diverse forest. It's bad news if you actually have to try to identify the trees and figure out what's going on. Um, fortunately, we've had a very good team of herbarium people. In fact, this is my wife that's taken a long time ago. Uh, but she coordinated the herbarium while she was doing her PhD work there. Uh, and she had a team of people, and there's just been a huge effort by a lot of different people to try to identify trees. We now have, in fact, it's, I think it's almost 98% of the trees are now identified, at least to species or to genus and morpho species level. Altogether, about 1,300 species. Does anybody know how many species are in Europe? I'm going to guess four or 500, perhaps, in all of Europe. That would be probably right. There's 700 species of trees in North America. Uh, sounds right, but right, maybe five, let's say 500. It's probably, it's probably, might be a bit generous, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> we're getting this in 69 hectares, so um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> I don't mean to be like macho about it or anything. I'm just saying that's what's going on. Okay, so, but it is a, you know, it was a real challenge to try to identify that many species, and, and uh, you know, a lot of them kind of look alike. Now, people who study fragmentation, habitat fragmentation, we sometimes call ourselves fragmentologists, um, tend to talk about stuff like this. And the issue is like, what's causing changes in habitat fragments? I mean, you know, why do you get a lot of species surviving in one fragment and very few species surviving in another? What kinds of things affect that? And so we tend to talk about things like area effects, which is how big is the fragment? You know, if it's something that's correlated with, if, if a, as a fragment gets smaller, are we getting dramatic changes? Area effects. We tend to talk about the isolation of the fragment. The isolation might just be how far is it away from a large tract of forest? Sometimes we'll talk also in a more functional sense about things like connectivity. Connectivity might be, well, maybe it's isolated, it's not very, you know, it's not far away, it's far away from a large tract of forest, but maybe there's a lot of secondary forest and maybe there's, uh, in, along streams, there might be a lot of vegetation growing and so maybe there could be a lot of things moving along those streams. So we talk about connectivity, which means just how connected might it be genetically and demographically to the population. So we can talk about isolation and connectivity. We talk about edge effects, which are ecological changes that are associated. When you create a habitat fragment, you end up, you know, especially in a rainforest, you end up with this environment where you, know, you have this sort of dense forest with a thick canopy, and then you just chop it, and you have this very dramatic difference between it and say something like a hot, dry cattle pasture. So the environmental conditions are completely different. So there can be a lot of environmental changes associated, or there can be environmental changes associated with that abrupt and artificial habitat edge. And then we also will talk about things like matrix effects. Now the matrix, it's not if you're not a fragmentologist, not like the movie, we're not talking about that kind of matrix, we're talking about the matrix for fragment pe fragmentation people is everything outside the fragments. So this could be cattle ranches, it could be secondary forest, it could be agricultural land, it could be cities, whatever. That is the matrix. And so um, the characteristics of the matrix may be important for the fragments as well. Now, one of the things I want to try to convince you of is that at least in this experiment, at least in this landscape, and at least over the last 35 years or so, it's turned out that the edge effects have been one of the most important drivers of change in this particular environment. And this is something that's been a really interesting uh, uh, outcome of this project. This here, and you, I know you really can't read this, but this here, this here are all of the different edge phenomena that we have identified so far that are happening in these fragments. 
This is the edge of the forest here, so this might be cattle pasture out here, and this is the number of hundreds of meters that those uh, edge effects are penetrating into the interior of the forest. So you can see they're wildly variable. There are microclimatic changes, there's changes in disturbance regimes, there's changes in faunal communities, there's invasive species coming in, there's changes in forest dynamics. I mean, there's just all kinds. They're very rich and eclectic. Uh, assemblage of different kinds of environmental changes and these have been in many cases really important in determining the fate of these fragmented forests. One of the most important edge effects that we've been studying has been tree mortality. It turns out that in these fragments a lot of the trees are dying, especially near the borders of the fragments. Why? Well, we're not absolutely sure. We only go back in every five years, but we think a couple of things are happening. One is that you know, again, when you create this abrupt edge, you get this very strong physical gradient between these hot, dry, windy cattle pastures where there's a lot of light and the rainforest, which is normally dark and humid and there's very little wind and the temperatures tend to be very stable. And what happens, is, again, when that, with that sharp edge, is those hot, dry, windy conditions tend to penetrate into the fragment. And we know, we're almost sure, that a lot of trees cannot, just can't withstand, they're not designed to withstand these really harsh microclimatic conditions. Because what we see is that a lot of trees just drop their leaves and they die. There's nothing physically wrong with them, they're not broken. There's nothing, they just drop their leaves and they die standing. So that's really one very common thing that we see. And that happens usually within a few months right after the edge is created. But a second thing happens is this. When you denude the lands around the fragments, the wind shear forces can build up. You don't have the forest there sort of creating a lot of friction. And so those wind shear forces can build up and the winds slam into the edges of the fragments and they knock trees over and they snap trees in half. And we know from wind tunnel models that what will happen is when you have an abrupt edge, the wind will come up over the top of the edge to, and then you'll, what you'll get is a lot of turbulence downwind. And so you get this turbulence coming over and the downward vector of that turbulence can pummel the forest canopy and it can actually create a lot of downwind turbulence. So we think that those two factors, and there's other kind of changes happening too. There's biological changes happening. There may be changes in diseases and parasites and things. But we know that these microclimatic changes and these wind shear effects are very important and that's what's accounting for a lot of the sharply elevated increase in tree mortality. So here we have our plots that are basically right next to the forest edge. These plots here, this, because that's a logarithmic axis, this is going about 3,000, a little over 3,000 meters into the forest interior. So we're getting you know, some variation in here, but a lot more tree mortality as we're getting closer and closer uh, to the forest edge. Now, it turns out that the matrix, that the characteristics of the vegetation next to the fragment are pretty important. Um, if we have regrowth forest, there's a, we get a couple of different kinds of regrowth forests in our areas. Uh, forests that are dominated by Cecropia, and other ones that are dominated by Vismia. It's not really important to worry about this, except that this comes in after you burn, or sorry, this comes in after you just cut the forest down, and this comes in after you cut the forest down and burn it. But the bottom line is, if you end up with some of this regrowth forest, which within five or ten years can be 15 meters tall, um, that seems to kind of provide a bit of a buffer against these harsh microclimatic changes. And so we don't see as the tree mortality being as high. But if you've got cattle pasture out there, which is not providing any protective effect at all, we're getting more tree mortality than we would otherwise with our secondary forests. Another thing that's important about the matrix is that the, the kinds of species that are growing in the matrix, if it's regrowth, are different. So if we have the Cecropius dominated regrowth, we get a particular set of species that tend to be coming into the fragments. We know that there's a lot of bats and a lot of birds that live in the fragments, but they fly out into the matrix to feed. So they go out and they eat the seeds and then they come back in and they poop the seeds into the fragments. And when there's a tree fall gap or an opening in the forest, that's where the seed, a lot of those seeds are coming from. So we know that the, the matrix also affects the tree species that are regenerating uh, within the fragments and that has very important long-term implications for the forest because once those seeds get established, that's the future of the forest in many cases. So the matrix is important along with the edge effects. Now these matrix or these edge effects um, and the elevated tree mortality seem to be having three main changes, three main impacts on the forest. One of the first is that they're altering the structure of the forest, they're altering the architecture of the forest. And you can actually see this from a satellite. This is a high resolution satellite image. This is made with an Iconos satellite, which has a, quite a fine pixel size, down to about 60 centimeters. 
And you can actually see here lots of tree fall gaps within these forest fragments. Okay, that's not a natural situation here. <laughs> Normally, this is all going to be just a, a dense, uh, or, or, or most of this is going to be a dense canopy, but there's a lot of tree fall gaps here that have been created. And as a consequence of all that forest disturbance, we see changes in the structure of the forest at all levels, from the ground right on up to the treetops. So for example here, this is what a quote-unquote undisturbed rainforest looks like. You don't, it tends to be quite open in the understory, tends to be very dark. Uh, you tend to get specialized plants living in this environment, but it's, uh, it's actually relatively open. Then, if you contrast that, this is what a disturbed rainforest looks like, okay? So there's a lot more light here. The microclimatic conditions are quite different. Um, it's considerably drier. There's a lot more fluctuation in temperature. But you see you get a whole proliferation of disturbance-loving species of plants that don't normally occur in a quote-unquote healthy rainforest, okay? These things are really kind of going crazy within a heavily disturbed rainforest. So it's a, it's a dramatically structurally different environment. The fragmentation really does affect things. We also see this structural change playing out in the sizes of the trees. So what we've done here is for each of these 69 one hectare plots, in this particular analysis right here, we've looked at them over about a 20 year period. So we went in before we fragmented the forest and we measured all the trees. And then we went back in 20 years later after the forest had been fragmented. Some of these plots are in intact forest and some of these plots are in fragments at different, differing distances away from the forest edge. And you can see here, um, here's our edge plots. The edge plots are everything, in this case, less than 100 meters from the edge, and the interior plots are everything between 100 meters and three and a half kilometers from the edge. But you can see here, with the interior plots, this is the percentage change in different tree sizes. So these are small trees, medium-sized trees, and then really big trees over here. This is a percentage change. So positive means that they're increasing, negative means they're declining. So look what's happening in the edge plots. Well, excuse me, we'll start with the interior plots. So in the interior plots, most of these values are not very far away from zero, right? We've got, you know, a lot of them are pretty close to zero. There's a little bit of change over here, but overall, things are fairly stable. In the edge plots, we're getting big declines in a lot of our trees, especially our larger tree size classes here. We're getting more small trees because what's happening is there's a lot of forest disturbance, a lot of trees are dying, and when they die, they create a tree fall gap, and that allows new trees to start regenerating uh, in their place. But the bottom line is, these structural changes that we're talking about are being reflected in the size distributions of the trees quite dram dramatically in the size distributions of the trees. A second category, so that's the first category, is we're getting changes in forest architecture. A sec second category is that we're getting changes in species composition, and this has turned out to be one of these really insanely complicated things that we've been spending years and years trying to understand, in part because, we, again, we have just so many species. Not only do we have lots and lots of species, but in many cases, we don't know anything about them. I mean, some of these species have never been properly studied. Uh, some of these species, they might know something about something that's related to it, but they don't know anything about that species itself. A lot of these things are extremely rare. Um, it really is sort of, in some senses, working out in the frontiers of, of a place where much is still not, un not known. In this particular case, what I've done is just asked how much in general has the tree community changed over that 20 year period? And this has got a measure here. This Euclidean distance basically says how dissimilar, how unlike the tree commun is the tree community over time. So what we're doing is we're comparing every plot to itself. 20 years ago, or 20 years before the forest was fragmented, and then 20 years later after it had been fragmented for a while, and we're saying how much change has occurred over that period of time over all the species of trees. And this here is a measure of that. So we can see here, deep in the forest interior, we are getting some change. The forest is not completely stable, but there's not a lot of change. As we get closer and closer to the forest edge, we can see the amount of change inc increases dramatically, okay? So there's a lot more change near these forest edges. It's not telling us anything about what's happening. It's just telling us that overall there's a lot more change. Well, to try to figure out what's going on, then we need to start looking at the characteristics of the tree species. Now, for starters, if you came to me and you said, well, what's going on? I could say, look, 
here's these lists. I can show you lists of hundreds of species of trees that these ones are increasing significantly in the fragments, and you know these are the winners, and these ones, are, here's the hundreds and even more, that are declining in the fragments. These are the losers, okay? We know who the winners and losers are. The problem is, is well, so I give you these big lists of species, species after species, and like, well, what does that mean? How do we interpret that? It's just a list of species, in many cases, which we don't know much about the, their biology. It's a real challenge. So what we've been doing for a long time is trying to figure out, well, what does all that mean? So what we've now done, not for the species of trees, but for the genera, okay? So we might have, you know, a particular genus like Inga, and Inga might have 12 different species within that genus, or Cecropia might have three, three different species in that genus. But, so we're lumping things at the genus level, um, which is, you know, at least it's a relatively fine uh, level, and we're then saying, let's look at all the characteristics, let's glean all the information we can about them. And so far we have 22 different characteristics that we've been able to get for all of our tree genera that have uh, changed significantly in the fragments. All of the winners and losers, we have now been able to figure out data for 22 different traits. And they include a lot of things around their distribution, about their demography and their growth rates, about their structure, their morphology their reproduction, their seed dispersal, and, and their physiology. So, a whole bunch of things here. Now, out of those 22 traits, if we compare the winners and the losers, uh, just using basic statistical tests one at a time, we can see out of those 22 traits, 13 of them, you can see here, everyone that's got a little star here, 13 of those traits differ significantly between the winners and losers. Okay, that's telling us that there's, there is a whole bunch of differences between the, the things that are doing well in fragments and the things that aren't. There's some important biological differences. So let's try to talk a little bit about what that means. Well, one of the things that we know is that when we fragment the forest, we get a huge proliferation of so-called pioneer species. These are things that like forest disturbance, they like a lot of light, they like tree fall gaps where the tr trees have been uh, op opened up and broken. If you log the forest, selectively log the forest, you get a lot of these things. And so if we just look at all these different um, of our major genera of successional trees or early pioneer species, um, we see that as we get closer and closer to the forest edges, we're getting a big increase in these things overall. Here's our champion right here. This is Cecropia sciatophylla. It's kind of very well known to anybody that works in the New World Tropics. It's increased so far by 3,300% um, in our fragments. And we have lots of other things that have increased by more than 1,000%. Um, also, not only are we seeing an increase, but the increase is increasing, okay? We're still, the longer the fragments go on, the more pioneers we get. So this is the age of the fragments right here. And this is the density of the pioneers here. The, each one of these represents a different fragment that's been sampled at different periods of time. And you can see here, that's a logarithmic axis, by the way. So here's one down here, here's 10, here's 100. So we're still getting a continuing increase over time in the abundances of our pioneers. So the fragments are still changing. They're still shifting more and more toward fragments that are dominated, hyper-dominated by a lot of these disturbance-loving pioneer species. And as you know, if, if you guys are ecologists, you know Whenever there's a winner in nature, there's got to be a loser. At the end of the day, it's almost always a zero-sum game. And so what we see that in general, very broad terms, that there's a negative correlation, a negative relationship between the number of pioneers or early successional species we have and the number of old growth things, things that like intact uh, old growth forest. So there's a strong negative correlation here. You get a lot of these pioneers and you tend to lose a lot of your old growth tree species. Again, the patterns I'm showing you so far are really simple. Okay, these are just really basic patterns. What we now want to do is try to look at this in a little more detail. And it turns out, again, there's a lot of complexity, a lot of nuances in all this. But one of the things that we've been able to figure out so far is not only are we getting a lot more pioneers, and not only are we losing a lot of our old growth trees, but also the old growth trees that per can survive, that can persist, that, those communities are getting restructured in some quite fundamental ways. And one of the things that we're seeing is that there's a whole an extremely diverse assemblage of trees that are specialized for living in the understory and subcanopy of the forest. These are smaller trees. These are some of the most specialized beasts out there in the forest. They basically are designed to spend their entire lives living down where it's very shady, okay? In the understory of the forest, you're typically getting about 1% of the sunlight, 1% of the photosynthetically active radiation getting down there in that understory, which means energy is critically limited. These things grow very slowly. They're adapted for very stable conditions. They're the only plants in the forest, the only trees in the forest that go through their whole life cycle, including the very energetically expensive thing which is producing fruit, 
and reproducing in that entirely shady environment. So they're very specialized physiologically and in every sense of their life history and biology for living in these dark, uh, shady, dark, forest interior environments. They're not fast growing at all. They have very dense wood. So, so this assemblage of these smaller subcanopy trees is one of the things that we really see dropping out of the forest fragments. Also, many of them tend to rely on animal seed dispersers and they tend to have so-called obligate outbreeding systems. In other words, you can't get one tree that's both male and female simultaneously and crossing itself. It can't be, these things have to, you have a male tree and you have a female tree and they have to, um, and they have to mate in that way. They have to have an animal, usually it's an animal, take their pollen from one tree to the next. So it's interesting, you know, we think that these shade tolerant things, they don't seem to be able to tolerate very well these dramatic changes in forest disturbance regimes and in edge effects that we're seeing in fragments. And maybe they're also just being outcompeted by all these pioneers that like the disturbance. We're not really sure. We also think though that the losses of animal pollinators and seed dispersers may be important. And we're losing a lot of those things from these fragments. If you think about it, if you're a big tall tree growing up in the top of the canopy, you know, you might be able to use wind to carry your pollen around and certainly to disperse some of your seeds, but if you're living down in the understory, you don't have any wind. There's almost no wind at all. So you have to have an animal, oftentimes a very specialized animal, that's going to take your pollen to another tree, it's, and it's also going to disperse your seeds. So these things, are, again, are very environmentally and ecologically specialized creatures, and they seem to be some of the most vulnerable things uh, in forest fragments. And again, there's hundreds of these species. These, this isn't just a scattering of a few dozen species. This is, these are some of the most diverse trees out in the Amazon rainforest. So it's, we're not talking about small scale changes. Now, the floristic changes don't just happen with trees, they happen with other groups too. One of the things that we're also seeing is that vines, particularly woody vines called lianas, um, and some of these can get quite large, are increasing in abundance. This is for all our plots right here. This is showing the number of the successional trees, the pioneer trees, and this is showing the abundances here. And you can see plots that tend to have lots of disturbances and tend to be near forest edges also are getting a lot of these lianas. Most lianas like disturbed forests. Um, they like tree fall gaps. They tend to, when you get small trees regenerating, regenerating in tree fall gaps, they tend to climb up them. They use the, those small trees as trellises. The liana, to complete its life cycle, has to get up into the forest canopy. Now, lianas are very tough competitors. They're ancient enemies of trees, and there's a very strong competitive relationship. Really, lianas are structural parasites of trees. Trees that get infested with lianas tend to grow more slowly. They tend to reproduce less. They tend to die more often. And in fact, when they die, they often kill other trees at the same time because what the lianas will often do is they'll grow up the trees, they'll entangle them, they'll strangle them, they'll present their foliage up above the trees so that they're competing for light, they've got their roots down there competing for nutrients and, and, and moisture. But if that tree dies, the lianas often grow also sideways in the forest and they start tangling up other trees. So that one tree can die and it'll often drag other trees down with it. In fact, loggers hate lianas, okay? One of the first things that loggers do when they go into a forest to log is they cut the lianas. They call them widow makers because imagine what happens. You cut a tree down, this tree falls, what you didn't notice was this liana hooking up to this other tree behind you, that tree comes crashing down on top of your head. So lianas can really change the ecology of the forest and they're becoming uh, much more abundant in the fragmented forest. They like these disturbed edge conditions. We see a higher, uh, significantly higher proportion of trees near edges that are infested with liana, lianas that have at least one liana. You can see some of these can get to be quite large. The largest liana that we found so far uh, was almost half a meter in diameter. Uh, so so some of these get to be fairly big. Um, and as I mentioned, trees that are infested with lianas tend to grow more slowly, they tend to die more often, um, you know, for various reasons, they, they, it tends to suppress their, their uh, growth and their biomass. What we have here is the total biomass of trees on our plots, and we have the density of lianas here, the abundances of lianas, and you can see here there's quite a strong negative relationship. Okay, lianas really are suppressing uh, some of that tree biomass. Now it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg thing here. You're tempted to look at that and you can say, okay, look, it's clear. Lianas, plots that have lots of lianas are, are just don't have as much tree biomass. But we also can't exclude completely another possibility, which is this. What if some other factor, like say a windstorm, comes in and disturbs the forest and kills some of the trees, and then because the forest is disturbed, the lianas start proliferating there too. So that kind of maybe a disease or maybe wind or some other kind of disturbance. So 
We can't completely exclude that possibility, although having worked in this area for quite a while and on, and on Leonis for quite a while, I'm convinced that most of this effect probably really is due to this sort of suffocating, uh, suppressive effect of lianas, which are these very important structural parasites. So this notion that lianas are suppressing tree biomass actually leads us very naturally into the third major consequence of habitat fragmentation, which is it's changing the carbon dynamics of these forests. Now that's really important from a global perspective. We know that the Amazon stores hundreds of billions of tons of carbon in its vegetation and in its below ground uh, carbon stores. Um, we know that the Amazon cycles huge amounts of carbon through the system every year. So if we're starting to change the carbon dynamics of these systems, this is something that can have potentially big implications. And in fact, it does. One of the things that we see is that not only when you degrade an Amazonian landscape, not only do you lose most of the carbon in the f where you clear the forest, but in fact the fragments that remain are also losing a substantial part of their carbon. And we can see here, here again is the distance of our plots to the forest edge, and here is the amount of change in biomass over time, again over about a 20 year period, and we can see a lot of these plots near forest edges are losing many tons of their biomass, many tons of their dry biomass, some of them up to 80 tons of, of total dry biomass. Why is that happening? Well, we think there's probably three main causes here. One, we already know that a lot of trees are dying in fragments, okay? There's a lot of tree mortality in fragments, but not only that, not only are more trees dying, but many of the trees that are dying are big trees, okay? And it's these big giant trees that really store a lot of the carbon in the forest, in, the, in their biomass. And of course, you know, about half of the biomass is carbon. Basically, you, you can convert uh, about half of biomass, 50% of the biomass is carbon. So what we have here is a comparison between the rate of mortality of trees in the interior of the forest and the mortality rate on the edge of the forest. And this is the increase, the percentage increase on the, uh, near the edge. And here's small trees, medium-sized trees, and then here's our largest trees here. You can see all the trees are showing an increase in mortality, basically a doubling of the mortality rate. But for the biggest trees, it's essentially a tripling of the mortality rate. The biggest trees are much more vulnerable to fragmentation. Not, we, don't, we don't really understand exactly why. Um, we, got, we have several hypotheses. One is that maybe they're more vulnerable to wind. One of the things that we know is trees get bigger and as they get taller, their shape changes. They get thicker and they get less flexible and they get obviously taller. So some of these trees can be 55, 60 meters tall. And you imagine you've got this big, tall tree that's losing a lot of its flexibility because it's getting thicker and then it gets affected by wind. Maybe those trees are getting knocked down more often or snapped in half more often. Um, maybe they're more vulnerable to, to drought stress. Um, we know in other studies that have been done that droughts are surprisingly, have surprisingly strong effects on big trees. You wouldn't think, how would you get a lot of big trees in the forest if they're that vulnerable to droughts? But we know that in studies in Panama and in the Amazon and Africa and other areas, when we get really strong droughts, a lot of the big trees are drying, dying. And so there appears to be a really, they have a big problem in getting water from the ground, from the roots, all the way up, you know, 50 to 60 meters up into the canopy. So they're really kind of at the physiological limits of what they're able to do. And then maybe you get surrounded by this harsh, dry environment and things dry out that much more. Maybe that just pushes them over the edge. So that's another idea. Um, maybe they're more vulnerable to things like lianas. We know that the older, the older trees tend to have higher infestations of lianas. Some people, have even, one person even suggested maybe they're acting like lightning rods. We actually know there's a lot of lightning out in some of these very strong conventional, uh, convectional uh, thunderstorms. There can be really intense lightning in some places. And you've cleared all the vegetation and you've just got a few really tall trees out in these fragmented forests. Maybe these things are just acting like lightning rods and getting hit, hit by lightning more often. We've got a whole bunch of ideas. We just don't know really what's going on. But we do know that the big trees are dying more often. So that's the second thing. A lot of trees are dying and a lot of the trees that are dying are big. But there's a third factor coming into this, and that is that the things that are coming in to replace the big trees, um, the things like the pioneer trees and the lianas, in fact, tend to have lower wood density, okay? Um, it's, you think about something like balsa, which has a you know, low density. So the lower the wood density, the less carbon that's being stored. So in generally speaking, fast growing things tend to have uh, low wood density. Slow growing things like these old growth trees, these specialized rainforest trees, tend to have high wood density. Think about something like mahogany. So what we see here, here's 41 different tree genera that have either increased or declined significantly in our fragments. 
And there's a very strong relationship here. The winners, these are the ones that are increasing in abundance. Look at these things tend to have very low wood density. So we're, we're losing uh, uh, carbon storage that way. The things that are losing here, these things have high wood density. Okay, so these are declining. So the bottom line is, as a consequence of losing a lot of trees, especially a lot of big trees, and then replacing them with things that don't store nearly as much carbon, partly because they're smaller, but also because they simply have lower wood density, all of this, con this conspiracy of factors is influencing or reducing the amount of carbon storage that's uh, occurring in these forests. By the way, we've estimated if this phenomena, if, you know, if, the, if this amount of carbon loss is happening in all the fragmented tropical forests around the world, that it would basically be equivalent to as much as 150 million tons of additional carbon emissions each year above and beyond all the emissions that are coming from the deforestation of the forest. And 150 million tons is equivalent to about what the United Kingdom uh, produces each year. So that's just as an example. Uh, that includes Scotland, by the way. I was just say I'm thankful to the Scots because I use the UK a lot in examples and I don't have to recalculate everything now that Scotland's still part of, it, of the whole thing. Um, we're not just seeing a loss of carbon, by the way. We're actually seeing a redistribution of carbon. The carbon dynamics and the distribution of carbon in the forest is changing. Because, for instance, we're getting a lot of woody debris. We're getting a lot of branches and trunks and leaves and other things that are accumulating on the forest floor. So you can see here, this is coarse woody debris, which is defined a certain way. Um, and you can see a lot more woody debris as you're getting closer and closer to forest edges. Um, also, we're getting a lot more leaf litter. And you really notice this. So you get a lot more accumulation of leaf litter as you're getting closer and closer to forest edges. This actually affects us field biologists quite a bit because in your, in the, when you're in the interior of the forest, where things are still humid and moist, well, you can walk around and you can be quiet. Like if you want to be bird watching, it's possible to, you know, you can sneak up on things. Near the edges, all those leaves get really dry. And it's try, like trying to walk on dry cornflakes. You can imagine trying to sneak up on anything uh, in that kind of environment. And it's because you're getting such an accumulation of uh, leaf litter uh, near to the forest edges. Now, so those are the three main categories of change that are happening in fragmented forests or are fragmented forests as a consequence of these really strong edge effects and interacting with matrix effects. And, but remember, I started off talking about the study and saying it's an experiment, okay? This is not the same as what's happening in most fragmented landscapes in other parts of the world, especially in other parts of the tropics. What we're seeing in these other environments are other kinds of environmental changes happening simultaneously. In fact, the analogy I would use is that if we were sort of in a boxing match with nature, you know, um, in this experiment, nature is just getting one punch. Okay, there's just one thing happening. But in the real world, out there where all kinds of changes are happening together, it's much more like a flurry of punches coming all at once. And it's that combination of punches that are really what's determining the net impact on species and in biological diversity. So for instance, if we look at other places in the Amazon, this is not our work, but some work by Carlos Perez and his students. Um, they're looking at forest fragments in the southern uh, part of the Amazon. They're looking at things like logging pressure here. So they've looked at a total of about 150 forest fragments. This is none, low, medium, high, and very high. So they're getting a lot of logging pressure and also hunting. You can see a lot of hunting pressure within these forest fragments. It's not just the fragmentation that's happening. It's it's all these other changes happening as well. Um, fire is a really big issue. There's a gigantic increase in fire intensity and frequency in fragmented forests, especially in parts of the Amazon where you get relatively strong dry seasons. What we have here, are, I don't know how well you can see this little curve right here, but it's not showing up that well. But what we have here are data from about 700 forest fragments over a 14 year period. These are data from remote sensing. And what we've done here is we've plotted the average fire frequency as a function of distances away from the forest edge, okay? So here's the edge of the forest. Out here would be mostly things like cattle pasture. And here's, you can see very few uh, uh, fires in the interior of the forest. They start increasing within about two, three kilometers of the forest. And then within about, say, 800 to 1,000 meters, we get this huge spike, this huge jump, exponential increase in fire frequency as we're getting closer and closer to forest edges. Why? Well. There's a lot more disturbance out there. There's a lot more leaf litter. There's a lot more uh, woody debris. And also, the ranchers burn their pastures every year. They do that to control weeds, and they do that to produce a flush of green grass, which the cattle like. So you have all these fires happening outside, and you have these dry, much more flammable conditions in the inside, 
and very often what happens is those fires tend to start penetrating further and further into the interior of the forest. And you get these fires, and they just go through like this. Now they don't actually look impressive at all. That's about a 20, 30 centimeter tall fire burning through the leaf litter. Doesn't look like it would be any big deal at all. I don't know in Sweden what kind of effects you would get in Australia. Fire ecologists would laugh at a fire like that. But fire is not a natural part of the disturbance dynamic. It is foreign to these types of environments. It's not supposed to be there. And that little fire right there will typically kill all of the forbs, all of the vines, most of the small trees, and in fact, over a period of about two to three years, many of the large trees. And then what happens? Those things start dying, and they start dropping their leaves and their branches on the forest floor, and the canopy starts thinning out, so it gets even drier, and wind gets down there and dries things out even more. Then what happens the next time a fire comes along? Well, those fire intensities tend to be much, much more intense a, a second time or a third time. So what you actually see in the, in the satellite images is a collapse. You actually see these fragments imploding over time as a consequence of this withering occurrence of fire after fire, which just gets more and more uh, intense. Now, the last thing I wanted to, s to mention is just our, the most recent work that we've done in, here in the Fragmentation Project. And this has been a little bit more subtle, a little bit more nuanced, but it's been very interesting to us because what we've been doing is looking at the forest dynamics and the um, other changes in, in things like liana communities in our plots, again, in this landscape where the disturbances like fire and hunting and logging have all been controlled, but still we're getting something else happening, okay? We shouldn't. And in a landscape like what, what we have, where things are controlled, you shouldn't have other things happening, and yet something is going on. And we've been trying and trying to figure out what is happening here, because what we discovered is that our intact forests, which we call our controls, our experimental controls, are not acting like controls. They're changing. In fact, they're not just changing, they're changing in concerted ways, okay? They're changing in a particular direction. And this has been really very mysterious to us. And what we've eventually concluded is that there's some kind of global change phenomenon that is altering these forests, even these, some of the most remote forests in the world. One of the things that we're seeing is that over the last 14 years, that the lianas in our forests have increased on average by about 1% per year in our intact forests, okay? Nothing has disturbed these forests. They haven't been logged, they haven't been burned. There's no history of agriculture or any kind of human land use in these forests at all. They're increasing over time. We know that the forests are becoming more dynamic over time. The trees are dying and recruiting more rapidly. They're becoming more, more dynamic. This has been a big surprise to us. We've been scratching our heads. And what we've ultimately concluded is that this is entirely consistent with an increase in forest productivity. Now the question is, well, what could be causing forests to become more productive? We know that lianas like more productive forests. We know that when you get forests becoming more productive, that trees tend to grow faster. When they tend to grow faster, they tend to compete more. When they compete more, they tend to die faster. When they die faster, you get more opportunities for new trees to recruit, so the whole forest becomes more dynamic. What could be causing this? Well, there's lots of different ideas, but the, one, the idea that we're most favoring now is probably the changing chemistry of the atmosphere, the increasing carbon dioxide. You know, plants use CO2 plus water for photosynthesis. And when you get more CO2, we know, for, at least from little small-scale experiments, that plants tend to grow faster. So in an environment where the CO2 levels are increasing, we may be getting fundamental changes in the dynamics and the composition even of our intact forests. Um, there's other possibilities. We know that there's a lot of forest burning going down. We know that ash is raining down. In some cases, we have smoke plumes over thousands of kilometers. Maybe some of that ash is coming down and fertilizing things. Maybe there's dust from the Sahara blowing over and providing a little more nutrients. Maybe all the nitrogen we're dumping in the atmosphere is, is changing things and increasing some nutrient levels. Um, maybe there's changes in solar intensity and cloudiness. There's a lot of different possible hypotheses. But the one that we keep coming back to, the one that's really the most consistent and compelling with all these uh, phenomena that we're observing is probably CO2. And there's a lot of debate and discussion about this right now, but we think it's probably the most likely explanation is that the chemistry of the atmosphere is changing and this is altering the dynamics, not just of our fragments, but of our intact forests as well. And so in our most, very most recent paper, what we basically said is this, to understand the dynamics of these fragments, you not only have to understand the fragmentation effects, you also have to understand the fact that there's some kind of large-scale global driver that's altering these forces as well. We think it's probably CO2, but we can't be absolutely certain of this. But the implication is this. There's probably nowhere on the planet, aside from a laboratory environment where you can absolutely control CO2, 
and other kinds, of, uh, other kinds of extrinsic factors as well. There's probably no place on the planet where you can do any kind of experiment and make us and safely assume that everything is going to be unaffected. That the, the whatever you're testing, be it land use change or logging or fire regimes or nutrients, that there's not something else coming in and complicating your story, complicating the picture. Because right now, what it appears is that things like carb that atmospheric chemistry and many other changes are affecting the entire planet. There literally is no place left on Earth that is not being affected in some ways, we think. And so there's no such thing as an experimental control. Every kind of experiment we may want to be run, including one like this, one of the largest and longest running experiments in the world, is being affected in some ways by global change phenomena. And with that, I thank you.